properties of solids. As you know, there are four states of matter, solids, liquids, gases, and plasma, which is essentially an ionized gas. Today's focus will be on solids. This is because solids are present as active ingredients or as excipients in dosage forms. So it's very important to understand their physical properties. Solids are either crystalline, so they come in polymorphs, solvates and hydrates, or co-crystals, or they can be amorphous, and more on crystalline and amorphous properties later on in the video. A crystalline solid is held together by non-covalent bonds. So I, either as an ion-ion interaction, where you have um, the charges attracting to each other, so a positive sodium to a negative chloride. You also have ion-dipole interactions, where a positive charge is attracted to a slightly negative charge, as seen in uh, H2O. And then you have dipole-dipole interactions, which happen between um, two slightly charged molecules uh, and a famous example is the hydrogen bond and you can also have hydrophobic interactions which happen in the interfoldings of protein. Just like cells in the human body, a unit cell is the smallest single building block in a crystal. Unit cells come in different shapes, cubic, trigonal, monoclinic or thrombic, hexagonal, etc. Drugs are most commonly triclinic, monoclinic, and orthrhombic. A crystal habit is the shape of the crystal when you inspect it visually. Don't confuse this with a unit cell. The unit cell is basically like the human cell, as I said. It's like what makes up the crystal on the inside, whereas the crystal habit is what you see on the outside. For example, a hexagonal unit cell can have a crystal habit that is either acicular, prismatic, or tabular. Crystal habits are important in terms of manufacturing because different habits have different flows. Here you have two manufacturing hoppers. The flow of the first powder is smooth, whereas in the second hopper drawn here, the powder doesn't flow as smoothly because its crystal habit is unsuitable. Sometimes, one crystal can have molecules arranging themselves in more than one way. This is called polymorphism, so it's when one crystal has more than one type of unit cell. Different polymorphs have different properties, and these polymorphs, crystals, are all, you know, the big picture is that we're looking at the properties of drug solids, so bioavailability is one of these properties affected by polymorphism. This polymorph is stable, meaning that its bonds are strong, requiring a high temperature to break them. So stability equals strength. If we take this polymorph and place it in a beaker of water, it won't break down into tiny particles because of its strong bonds. This is an example of a hydrophobic drug. Therefore, polymorphism must be controlled either via spectroscopy or x-ray diffraction. So it's very important in hydrophobic drugs because you don't want to be forming a crystal that has a stable form because these stable crystals or these stable, sorry, polymorphs won't be soluble because of their strong bonds. So when creating or when you're manufacturing hydrophobic drugs, you want to avoid the formation of the stable polymorph. To recap, polymorphism is when one crystal has molecules arranging themselves in different ways, with each polymorph having different properties. One polymorph is stable, the other is metastable. The stable form has stronger bonds, therefore is poorly soluble, reduced, thus reducing bioavailability. Now let's talk about hydrates and solvates, both of which are crystalline solids. Sometimes, during the crystallization process, materials are trapped within the crystal lattice. If the material was water, the resulting crystal is known as a hydrate. Hydrates are ratio-dependent, with the ratio being in trapped water to the ratio of crystal. Monohydrates have a ratio of 1 to 1, dihydrates have a ratio of 2 to 1, and so on. If the entrapped material wasn't water, the resulting crystal is known as a solvate. For example, entrapped ethanol will result in the formation of ethanolate. Next, we have another type of solids, an amorphous solid, which is essentially a messy crystal. 
The messy crystal forms if the solidification process happens too fast, giving the crystal little time to properly align. Amorphous solids have different properties in comparison to crystalline solids. They don't have melting points. Instead, amorphous solids have a glass transition temperature, Tg. Above the Tg, the material becomes rubbery. Below the glass transition temperature, the material becomes brittle and glassy. Usually, the brittle and glassy state is preferable. So, to lower the glass transition temperature, a molecule known as a plasticizer is added to ensure that the solid is kept in the crystalline state. Here is a comparison between an amorphous solid and a crystalline solid in terms of properties. Amorphous solids have a glass transition temperature, whereas a crystalline solid have melting points. Amorphous solids have poor flow. Crystalline solids have good flow. Amorphous solids have better compression because uh, you can picture them as jagged edges of a puzzle that fit perfectly together, whereas crystalline solids have poor com compression properties. Amorphous solids don't have a crystal lattice, and crystalline solids obviously have a crystal lattice. Just something I forgot to mention earlier is crystal formation. So in order to form crystals, you need to first have a super saturated solution. Um, the next step is nucleation and lastly growth. Now that we've covered the different types of solids, here's a little bit more about their properties. A high melting point indicates that the intermolecular bonds within a crystal are very strong, meaning that the solubility is reduced and hence the bioavailability is also reduced. Particle size is another property. Say you have a large cube and you cut it down to smaller cubes. The smaller cubes having a smaller particle size will actually have a larger surface area. So by reducing the particle size you get a larger surface area because more of it is exposed. This increases solubility. So overall for solids, solubility increases with increasing surface area, reducing the particle size, and reducing the melting point. Thanks for watching.